Hello, my IB physicists. So if you weren't here in class on Monday, March 3rd, hmm. yeah, I know dates, um, then you missed doing this in class. And you're probably like, how am I supposed to do the vector problem today, Ms. Geth? Well, I made you a video for it. Um, I don't know if I'll do this for every single vector problem today. So like, come to class, you know? Mm -hmm. I'd love to see you there. Um, but the point of the vector problem of the day is that vectors are going to be really important for understanding forces for both this unit and into next unit and beyond in physics. Forces are fundamental here in physics. They help us predict motion, this motion we've been learning about with constant velocity and constant acceleration. Forces have a really big impact on that. So our vector problems of the day are going to be looking at... Uh, some specific situations. So we'll be sort of going to more and more challenging situations as we go through our vector problems of the day. Uh, but the one we're starting with right now is day ones. And this is page 4.3 4 .3 of your binder. Um, and I really highly recommend writing it right on this binder paper with me right now. So this one is called calculating resultants from orthogonal vectors. So what that means is that we are going to do a calculation, obviously of the resultant or answer vector from orthogonal vectors. And orthogonal is just a really fancy word for perpendicular, which is just a really fancy word for at a right angle or at a 90 degree angle to each other. Uh, and so in that, this case, it means in the X and Y directions. So we have a ship's motor drives forward at five meters per second north. And then uh, there's a wind pushing it east at three meters per second. So I'm going to go ahead and draw those vectors on my little x, y axis here. Um, and I'm going to start with that first one. Uh, forward, 5 meters per second north. So I'm going to use my cardinal directions here. So this would be 5 meters per second. Uh, so it's north. Then we have a wind pushing it east at 3 meters per second. So north, east, south etc. But now here's east. I know it's a little bit shorter, 3 meters per second. And I want to figure out what the resultant velocity of the ship is. So it's going to be adding these two vectors together. Well, you might notice that what I've drawn here is not actually adding these two vectors together. They're not showing the path that we trace out, or the path that you go to show from where we start to where we end. Both of my vectors here are both having their, their tails touch each other, essentially. So I'm going to redraw this, drawing it as a vector addition that goes tip to tail. So I'm going to do the x direction first, so that's 3 meters per second, and then the y direction was 5 meters per second north, so 5 meters per second up. And those are sort of scaled correctly. I'm going to make that 5 a little bit longer. Um, and notice I'm not being super picky about scaling correctly. The great thing about doing this mathematically is that you don't have to worry too much about uh, the perfect scale. Just having it be right-ish, you know, the 5 is clearly bigger than 3, is useful. So then my resultant vector will look like this, except it won't be wobbly, because drawing is hard. So this is our resultant velocity of the ship, and we want to actually calculate what is the magnitude of that vector, and what direction, what angle, is it at. So to calculate the magnitude of the velocity, we'll use our old friend a squared plus b squared equals c squared, your Pythagorean theorem from math class. It's always super useful. Square roots of both sides. So that c is going to equal the square root of 5 meters per second squared plus 3 meters per second squared, all under the square root. Uh, and then c, that'll equal a... 25 plus 9, uh, and those are both meters squared per second squared and nine. Uh, we're going to get something with units meters per second because the square root of meters squared per second squared is meters per second. Um, and I'm going to let you figure out what that is. So this is going to be some number of meters per second. And that's the magnitude, which I wrote as C, but really that's our velocity's magnitude. Then I want to find the angle. And you might be thinking, hmm, angle, how do I do that again? You, were, you learned it at one point in your trig class. Um, and so we're going to use our old friend, so, huh, 
So, uh, which one? Hmm. Well, you might notice that actually if I know V, that means I know the hypotenuse of the triangle. This is the hypotenuse. This side is opposite and this side is adjacent. So I actually know all of the sides of the triangle now, but V we have calculated and it's some decimal number. So it's a little bit annoying. When it's a calculated number, maybe I had to do some rounding. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and use my, my adjacent and opposite sides. So that's going to be using TOA or tangent. And the way we can go ahead and do that is we say, oh, I know that the tangent of the angle is going to equal the opposite side or five meters per second over the adjacent side, three meters per second. And then you maybe remember from math class, there's that thing uh, where you do the inverse tangent or tangent minus one inverse tangent function. Um, the meters per second does cancel out. So it's the inverse tangent of five thirds will equal our angle. And then here's the important part. You're going to go ahead and double check that your calculator is in degrees. So it's in degrees and you're going to get an angle answer in degrees. And again, I'm going to let you calculate that because I don't have a calculator handy and I should do something for this problem. Um, so then I would report my answer that the velocity is the number meters per second at the angle that I calculated in degrees, except your answer should actually be a number here and also a number here. Um, if I were guesstimating, I'd say it's like six point something, and then the angle is like more than 45, but like less than 80. And I'm just sort of judging that from this picture here. Whew. Okay. So this was our first factor problem of the day, and it's just something you've already done before a little bit. Um, so hopefully that went okay for you. Easy. So our next vector problem of the day, and also I think it's currently recording nothing in my little spot, so let's stop doing that. Um, our next vector problem of the day is in fact a little bit more challenging, but still something you've done before. It's just a little scary looking. So if you find this one, you're like, ah, oh, this was confusing. It is confusing. It's okay. We're going to practice this again, but I wanted to introduce you to this weird concept um, early on in this unit, because I know it's a challenging one to get. So we're going to be breaking a vector down into its X and Y components. And you already have done that before with a vector that's just like, here's this vector and here's the angle it's at. You've been like, oh great, here's the X component, here's the Y component. I use SOHCAHTOA to find it. Wonderful, very straightforward. And this is also essentially the same process, um, except we're going to be doing something weird. We're going to be shifting our X and Y axes to be on this hill. So notice X and Y are still perpendicular to each other, still a right angle here, but I've just like rotated my paper. Um, and so what we're doing is we're going to be taking, uh, drawing a vector that represents the 50 Newton force of gravity on this sled. And our goal is to determine the horizontal and vertical components of the force of gravity or the X and Y components, horizontal and vertical is not what you mean with this. Um, the X and Y directions that are parallel and perpendicular to the hill. So I'm going to start out by drawing in my force of gravity and I'm just going to draw it in. It, force of gravity always goes straight down. You've maybe learned about it in previous classes. Um, that is not straight down like that. I can do this. I can do this. Mm, I, I sort of did it. I did it okay. I'm going to make it a little longer. Um, so here's my force of gravity. I put an arrow tip on it. Make sure your vectors have arrow tips. This is a really unattractive vector. I'm sorry. Maybe yours is prettier. I'm going to label it 50 newtons. Um, and then I've drawn it straight down, which is easy to do with my paper or into the normal way. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to physically rotate my paper so that X and Y are like normal looking to me. X is horizontal, Y is vertical, or they, they look normal to me. So I'm physically rotating the paper in front of me. I'm, for me, it's my iPad, but for you, it's your paper. Um, because what I then need to do is go ahead and say, well, in the X direction, that's like this far. 
in the x direction, so this is the x component uh, that's parallel to the hill, and then the y direction is like that, that's perpendicular to the hill. And so by rotating my paper, it makes it a lot easier to make sure that I still have a right angle between the x and y components. That right angle between the x and y components needs to stay there. So then you might be saying, okay, cool, well we know 50 newtons here, but we don't really know anything about this angle right here. Um, and you're right, but actually, there is something we know. We know that gravity is perpendicular to the horizontal. And we also know that this angle right here, I'll put two lines on it. This angle with two lines on it is 30 degrees. Right there, 30 degrees. So if that angle is 30 degrees, that tells me that the angle I really want to know about, which I'm going to make be pink, what we need is more color. So this angle, that means, must be 60 degrees. It must be the complement of that angle because this is a little baby sized red triangle. And so I can say, oh, awesome. I know that angle then is 30 degrees. I'm going to get rid of this stuff because I don't actually care about it. And I'm going to go ahead and solve for my x and y components now that I know the angle that the gravity vector makes with the x direction. So my force gravity here, I know makes a 60 degree angle, the x direction, um, and the x side is adjacent. So that means that I'm going to go ahead and use my cosine of theta. Again, if I were you, I would actually write down um, to Fatoa. Oh no, I've got to go fast. Um, and that'll be the x over the 50 newtons, and you can solve for x. Then you'll do the same thing for the y direction, except that will be the, oh, maybe I don't have to go back, except that will be the sine, since it's opposite the angle, I'll just write there, it's opposite of um, sine of theta, will be equal to y over 50 newtons. Um, and we actually know theta maggots, let's put that in there. Do, do, do. Oh. It is, what was it, 60 degrees. Notice it's degrees. Make sure your calculator is in degrees. Do, 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 do. Uh, 60 integral degrees. And so then I can go ahead and solve for that. Um, so I'll solve for the x component with you right now because I think I do have a little more time left on my recording. And then I'm going to let you solve for the y component yourself. So to solve for the x component, I'm going to multiply both sides by 50 newtons, 50 newtons. So I have 50 newtons times the cosine of 60 degrees is equal to x. Um, I'm going to use my unit circle knowledge. And I'm going to remember that cosine of 60 is equal to 1 half. 1 half times 50 newtons is 25 newtons is the x direction and i'm going to add in that that's a negative 25 because look how it is pointing down the x-axis the x-axis is going up the hill that's where the arrow is and it's pointing down the hill so i'm going to have it be negative 25 newtons in the x direction you'll want to go ahead and take some time to solve for the y direction right now You'll have to use your calculator on that one because I don't know what three over two, um, but you can do so. And then you'll be able to have both the X and the Y components solve for. Um, and this is something that we'll be using actually a little while in a couple weeks from now here in this unit to solve really complicated problems with objects on hills that might be sliding down the hill or maybe you don't want it to slide down the hill. We'll do lots of solving with those things. So hopefully this was helpful for you and hopefully I didn't run out of recording time. I didn't! Success. Excellent. I uh, hope to see you all in class on Monday. Come to class. It's so useful. I miss seeing you.